Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. And I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. Well, howdy there, true crime fans. We got a rootin' tootin' good time for you today as we step back into the wild, wild west. Yeehaw! So saddle up them horses, partner, and dust off them reins as we get into the life and times of infamous outlaw, gunslinger, mountain man, and old-timey serial killer, Boone Helm. The Kentucky Cannibal. Oh boy, we are in for a treat. Let's begin. What is known in American culture as the Wild West is said by most historians to have begun in 1803, when the United States government acquired 828,000 square miles of land west of the Mississippi River from France in what is known as the Louisiana Purchase. This massive chunk of land doubled the size of United States territory and stretched from the Gulf of Mexico through the Ozarks and the Rocky Mountains and extended north to the upper borders of what is today North Dakota and Montana. This is the beginning of the westward expansion of the United States, and by the 1840s, settlers were beginning to pour into what was called the American Frontier a migration that was further hastened by the discovery of gold in California. The American frontier was composed of undeveloped territory that the United States Census defined as unoccupied land with a population density of fewer than two people per square mile. Basically, a frontier is lands beyond the edge of a settlement, and it is generally agreed on by historians that the time period known as the Wild West ended around the 1910s when the U.S. Census ceased to show a westward frontier line. This period that's become known as the Wild West was a time of unimaginable brutality and anarchy when laws either didn't exist or were near impossible to enforce. A time of outlaws, gunslingers, desperados, and bandits. A time when might made right. And no man encapsulated the savagery better than Boone Helm, the Kentucky cannibal. Levi Boone Helm was born in Lincoln County, Kentucky, on January 28, 1928. Boone was one of 11 children, and the family lived a tough, hard scrabble life as unskilled laborers doing farm work and digging ditches, a nomadic existence where they'd pack up and travel to where there was work, barely eking out enough money to survive. This was namely a result of Western expansion. The earliest settlers were able to secure their own land and start their own farms and homesteads, making them more or less elite landowners. Those that followed behind were first forced to work as laborers with no land of their own. So, When it was announced that new settlements were opening up in Missouri, Boone's father leapt at the chance of owning his own land, packed the family up, and headed west with the ever-expanding frontier line. They settled in Jackson Township in Monroe County, Missouri, right on the Santa Fe Trail. With their own parcel, the family had their chance at the American dream and set out to earn it. The large family worked hard and became well-respected members of the community. Boone's father, Joseph, became known as a man who would always help his neighbor, pitching in at harvest season. And Boone's mother, Nancy, became very popular with the other wives of Missouri, passing on recipes and showing them old tricks she learned to stretch provisions and make supplies last. The family prospered in Missouri. Boone was a large boy and muscular from a life of hard work. At just 10 years old, He was as big as the teenagers in Jackson Township and palled around with them. The boys would stalk and trap animals. And it's said that, like many who go on to become serial killers, Boone delighted in torturing small animals. While most of the boys would break a rabbit's neck when they caught one in the snare, Boone would skin them alive, relishing the screams the small furry animals would make. And 
I just want to point out real quick here, the screams of rabbits are well known to be absolutely horrifying to hear. When the FBI and the ATF stood siege over the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas, they actually played the sounds of rabbits being killed over loudspeakers to unnerve, terrify, and basically freak out the cult members locked inside their compound. But Boone, he liked to hear these chilling screams at only 10 years old. As the youngest of the group, Boone often had to fight to earn his place and gain respect, and he never backed down and never lost a fight. But while most of the fights would be short, simple affairs, a few punches to see who was the toughest, Boone would take it to another level. When an opponent fell, he'd go right down with them, swinging ferociously the whole way. Often he would have to be dragged off a boy for fear that he'd kill them, and often he'd then turn his fists onto the ones who had pulled him away. But eerily, they say there was a calmness to him during a fight, a cold and calculating demeanor. He wasn't emotional, wasn't filled with anger. He was methodical and efficient. By the time Boone was a teenager, he was boxing and wrestling grown men in exhibitions, relishing the attention and eager to prove himself the toughest man around even if he was only in his teens. He practiced other feats to prove himself as well. He'd ride his horse at full gallop, then throw his bowie knife ahead where it would embed itself into the ground. And then, as he passed the knife, he'd leap off his horse, grab the knife up, and swing himself back atop the horse, remounting at full speed, the horse never slowing. It was a wild stunt that left spectators in awe. As his brothers grew older, they set out to make careers for themselves, working with the local mining concerns or moving westward with the frontier to claim farms and homesteads of their own. His sisters began to marry and start families. But Boone just kept on going with his life as the town tough guy and bully, brawling in bars and taverns. He was becoming a great disappointment to his hardworking father, who had spent so much effort becoming a stalwart member of the community. Because of his exploits, he was also becoming very well known to the sheriff, receiving countless threats and warnings about his abusive behavior, behavior, spending many a night in a jail cell. It got so that when Boone saw the sheriff on the street, he would just begin to yell at him and hurl insults at him antagonizing him. After a particularly nasty brawl in a saloon, the sheriff decided enough was enough and procured a warrant for his arrest. He attempted to serve the warrant to Boone, but Boone refused to get off his horse. Instead, he rode the horse right up the courthouse steps and inside, bursting into court in session on his horse, screaming insults and bellowing curses, demanding to know what darn fool judge had the audacity to put his name on a warrant. Incredibly, the judge rescinded the order for his arrest and waived the charges. Crazy. And Boone, he just rode his horse on out of the courthouse, down the steps, and past the sheriff and his deputies, tipping his hat and saying, Better luck next time, boys. And such was the nature of the American frontier and the Wild West, a place where the toughest, boldest, and brashest were often beloved and respected. At 20 years old, Boone was the last of his siblings to still be living in his parents' house. Lounging about without a job, having his mother cook his meals, the OG slacker. His father took to ignoring him, even refusing to speak to him, seeing him as a failure and a man-child. Boone had been through his share of women, using them as he saw fit, and then abandoning them when he was done. But there was one who wouldn't give in to his masculinity and charm, Lucinda Browning. She wasn't going to be swept up by his animal magnetism and silver tongue, only to be tossed aside. She was too smart for that, and too good for that. So Boone set to courting her proper, promising her a happy life and marriage. And after a long courtship, with both the family's consent and blessing, they were married in 1851, in the very same courthouse Boone had marched his horse into only months earlier. Boone's parents were ecstatic, believing this marriage was just what Boone needed to start a respectable life. 
They felt that with a wife, he'd settle down, have a family, and finally find the responsibility and maturity he had been so lacking. Unfortunately, that would not be the case. Boone drank so much on his wedding night that he had to be carried to his marriage bed, and his new wife spent the night making sure he didn't suffocate on his own vomit. The marriage was an ugly affair. Now that Boone had secured his prey, he couldn't care less about putting on respectable airs and pretending to be a kind and caring person. That was all an act to get her where he wanted her. When he wanted to make love with his wife, there was no delicate play, no loving teasing, no romance. He'd simply grab her by the hair and drag her to bed, violently assaulting her and rolling away when he was done. Boone spent his days drinking and gambling in the saloon, and Lucinda had to rely on her parents for financial support. Boone beat her mercilessly for any infraction, perceived or otherwise, and she often had black and blue eyes and a split lip when she went to town for supplies. Boone slipped into full-on alcoholism, running up tabs at every bar in town, drunkenly riding his horse into the house, feeding it off his own plate as muck and mud from the creature's hooves littered the floor, expecting Lucinda to clean up it all, to clean it all up. With the taverns in town refusing to serve him and desperate for income, Boone decided to try his hand at mining and took off with some drinking buddies to pan for gold, not even telling Lucinda he was leaving. It was during this absence that she realized she was pregnant, and something changed within her. She'd grown resigned to a life of violence and degradation. Like many women on the American frontier, this was just her lot in life. But an innocent child didn't deserve that, so she decided she was going to get a divorce. When Boone returned from his mining escapade, the petition for divorce had already been lodged at the courthouse. He flew into a rage, demanding to know who had financed the costly procedure. Who was the man who was trying to steal his wife and cuckold him to shame him? And to his great surprise, he discovered it was his own father who had paid for the divorce out of shame. Boone had no money for a lawyer, and there was no denying the abuse Lucinda had suffered. Everyone in the little town had seen her black and blue, limping along, haggard and hungry for nearly all of their terrible marriage. So Lucinda got the house the two had shared in the divorce. Destitute, Boone decided to return to his parents' homestead to live once again. Only when he arrived, he found the ranch shuttered and locked, empty. Boone's father hadn't only paid for the divorce, he'd given his savings to Lucinda to raise her child, going bankrupt in the process, selling off the land and moving on, leaving his disgrace of a son behind. Boone was now a town pariah. He took to sleeping in the stables, stinking of manure, and leeching off of anyone he could. One of those was a second cousin named Littleberry Shoot. Okay, Fuck, I'm sorry. Say. If we go to the Wild West, I get the name Littleberry Shoot. Like, I'm calling that one. <laughs> you don't want to be Lucinda? <laughs> no, I get Littleberry Shoot. <laughs> I love all these names. They're so, so good. Littleberry. Uh... So Littleberry was much younger than Boone and had long been enamored with Boone's fighting skills, his agility on a horse, and general manliness and toughness. Boone wanted out of Missouri, where he was seen as an outcast, an abusive drunk, and basically just a dismal failure in life. Not to mention, the sheriff was on him like stink on shit. He decided to follow the frontier line west and make his fortune in the gold rush either in California or Texas. Texas seemed like the next big place, and his eldest brother had already really relocated there and appeared to be doing quite well. So Boone set to convincing Littleberry to pack up with him, become road partners, and strike out to make it rich in the wild west of the American frontier. Littleberry was skeptical, but like most at the time, the pioneer spirit raged in him, causing him to seriously consider this adventure. One night, drinking heavily, Boone cornered him in a tavern and was able to get him to agree to strike it south to Texas to find their fortune. 
They'd leave in the morning, first thing. Boone was up at dawn, eagerly packing his few possessions and heading to his cousin Littleberry's house. But when he arrived, much to his disappointment, Littleberry hadn't packed, wasn't ready for the open trail as he'd drunkenly promised in the saloon the night before. Boone asked his cousin, And what you say to the Texas question? And when Littleberry replied, I say, no. Boone sunk his bowie knife into Littleberry's heart. He'd later say it had been some strange instinct, like a dream, that he didn't even have a recollection of doing it, that he'd just looked down and seen the knife embedded deep in his cousin's chest. Littleberry then toppled to the ground, stone cold dead. Boone wiped the blood off his knife on a blanket, grabbed what little of worth he could from the house, and headed towards California, hoping the law would think it was a robbery, and that if they did suspect him, they'd think he was headed to Texas, as he'd been drunkenly telling everyone he was going to do. But the body was discovered just later that day, and the sheriff wasn't fooled. They knew right away it was Boone who'd done the dastardly deed. And his ruse of going to Texas didn't work either, as he left a clear trail in the direction of California, not Texas. A posse was formed and were soon hot on his trail. While Boone may have been the toughest man in town, he had no experience in the wilds, was not an adept traveler. He failed to bring adequate feed for his horse and had only a small amount of water for himself. Instead of hightailing it west, he was forced to zigzag in search of streams to fill his water skin and take long breaks in grasslands so his horse could feed. And within just a few short days, he was saddle sore and rubbed raw, forced to walk, leading his horse, who was growing thin and irritable. The posse were confused by Boone's trail. He was ambling about in circles, even crossing his own path at times. His weird rambling path also went into Indian territory, which was sovereign native land with no laws. Encroaching on native land could not only get the posse killed, as it was seen by the natives as tantamount to an invasion by a hostile force, but it could also enrage the natives, causing them to raid the little town as vengeance. And there'd be little to stop them. The military was still busy with the Mexican-American War. Even though the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo had been signed by the Mexican government, troops were still amassed on the border and had no time to help quell troubles with the Native Americans. Boone's wanderings could be like kicking a deadly wasp's nest. But they did eventually find Boone. His horse was tied to a tree. He was dead. And Boone was squatting in a dried-out riverbed, trying futilely to suck water out of the mud. He was gaunt, parched, and sun-scorched, and readily confessed the prospect of a bed, water, and food in jail much preferable to his present situation. They had actually rescued him from sure death. And on the way back, Boone behaved bizarrely, breaking out into giggles for no reason, talking to himself. Several times he threw himself off the sheriff's horse and ran about crazily. Eventually, they hogtied him and tossed him over the saddle. When they camped for the night, Boone sat up all night, talking madly to himself, whispering and laughing. It became clear to the posse that he'd gone mad. When they got to town, he was jumping at shadows and flinching at any sound. They brought him before the same judge in the same courthouse that he'd once boldly ridden his horse into. The sheriff told the judge that he appeared to have gone insane. In those days, punishment for murder was hanging in the town square, but they did have leniency for the insanity defense. Even in those brutal days, one could plead innocent by reason of insanity. The judge felt something had always been off with Boone and ordered him examined by a physician. The physician confirmed he had indeed lost his mind, and instead of being hanged, Boone was sent to a sanitarium for the criminally insane to spend the rest of his days. But they'd underestimated the cold, calculating ways 
of Levon Boone Helm. It was all an act. He dropped it as soon as he arrived at the sanitarium. He still had his wits about him. Eager to please, he became the model inmate. He was polite, didn't act up, was even helpful, and became a favorite of the staff. So much so, in fact, that he'd be given special privileges, such as every evening he was allowed to stroll the grounds with a guard, get some fresh air, and take in the scenery. The guard got to trusting him so much that he let him wander off a ways to pee on this old willow tree. And one evening, when Boone left to pee, he didn't come back. He'd run off. The guard, afraid of getting in trouble, didn't even report him missing. By the time the staff noticed Boone was missing, he'd been long gone and the trail had gone cold. There wasn't even any use in forming a posse to search for him. Besides, he was crazy and had no provisions. He'd just die out there on the frontier anyway. But although Boone's survival skills were known to be lacking, as evidenced by his last foray into the wilderness, when he'd nearly ended up as dead as his horse, he did survive. He befriended a kindly prospector on his way to California for the gold rush, and the lonely good soul allowed Boone to join him. But Boone's devious ways soon revealed themselves when the prospector caught him rummaging through his belongings. The prospector demanded Boone stop, but Boone kept right at it, emptying sacks, until the prospector physically grabbed Boone and pulled him away from his property. Soon, the two were scrapping, and the prospector, in prime physical shape from his rugged life on the road, was winning. But he made a fatal mistake and tried to reason with Boone. Bad idea. Boone acquiesced before springing up and striking the prospector in the face with a rock. And just like those boyhood days when Boone fought to prove himself with the local youths, he kept on swinging, pummeling the man even after he fell to the ground. He went on hammering the rock into the prospector's face till little of his head remained, just a bloody pulp of fragmented bone and brain. Boone was all set up for his westward travel now with all the supplies he needed. But the trip would be long and grueling, one that Boone barely survived, having to rely on absolute savagery to make it. Just to put it in perspective, it is 2,054 miles from St. Louis, Missouri to San Francisco, and that's as the crow flies. Boone purposely went off the beaten path, believing he was being hunted, when the truth is there was no manhunt afoot at all. Authorities believing a lone man with no supplies or experience was doomed on the American frontier. He'd have to cross rivers, canyons, deserts, and both the Rocky Mountains and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. And we all know how the Donner Party fared in the Sierra Nevadas. We have to do a show on the uh, Donner Party especially uh, Lewis Keysburg, another Wild West American cannibal. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in Kansas, Boone hooked up with a wagon train who invited him to join the caravan. He used some of the prospector's money to procure more supplies and tobacco. But he was wary of traveling with a big group and wandered off on his own again. Those he encountered in large groups were lucky, when he'd discover a lone traveler, he made quick work of them, often shooting them from a distance before they even realized he was there. Boone trudged forward. As the weeks became months and the seasons passed, when he ran out of food, he butchered his donkey and ate that. But soon the donkey jerky ran out as well, stumbling along, starving on the edge of death with not a scrap of food in sight. He came upon a lone hunter one night, sitting before a fire. Boone immediately shot the man, without so much as a wave or a howdy, stranger. He crept to the corpse, sitting beside the fire, racked with hunger pains and cramps, and set to work butchering the man. Using his bowie knife, he carved off a fillet of muscle and held it over the fire on his knife, drooling as the fat sizzled and the scent of roasting meat filled the night air. 
He ate and ate till he was bloated and feeling sick, then shut his eyes and let sleep take him. Revived, he set out again in the morning, moving westward deeper into the American frontier, dreaming of the promised land of California like so many settlers before him. But soon he was growing hungry yet again, and he cursed himself for leaving so much good meat behind. Next time, he wouldn't be so foolish. It must have been sheer luck that found him crossing the Sierra Nevadas at a good time. Because I can tell you, I lived in Lake Tahoe for years, and it can snow anytime. June, July, August, it, it can just start dumping out of nowhere. Oh my God, that's crazy. I did <laughs> yeah. not know that. <laughs> it's a shitty place to garden. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But Boone, unlike the Donner Party, made it over the Sierra Nevada mountains and down into the Sacramento Valley. He'd actually made it across the entire American frontier through ruthlessness and savagery, cannibalism, and murder. But he'd made it to the promised land. He continued westward through the gold country, finally into San Francisco. As luck would have it, and this guy has some kind of crazy luck. I mean, he should have been hanged for murder years ago at this point. Boone ran into some distant cousins in San Francisco. Somehow news hadn't reached the coast yet of how he'd murdered another cousin in cold blood and escaped a sanitarium for the violently insane. His cousins were happy to see fellow kin there on the western seaboard. These cousins, John and William Johnson, were no angels themselves. They'd been in gunfights and duels. Both had killed men. But... Such was life on the American frontier. It was the Wild West, and only the violent and deadly survived. Well, they set out to impress Boone with their toughness in a drinking session, bragging about bar fights and murder, expecting Boone to be starstruck and in all of their machismo ways. Boone just rolled his eyes at their exploits as they talked about taking a man's eye in a bar fight and a winning duel at high noon. The cousins grew irritable at his lack of respect, asking, What have you done to roll your eyes at us? Boone grimaced, gulped his whiskey, and gave them a scowl, saying, Many's the poor devil I've killed at one time or another, and the time has been that I've obliged to feed on some of them. The packing order had been established. The Johnson boys had their own mining claims, and Boone went out with them to work in exchange for a cut of the gold. The three made a habit of panning and mining enough gold to head back to town to spend it in whorehouses, drinking and gambling, then go back out to their claims and scratch more wealth up from the earth. Often when in saloons, Boone would pick a fight, and often it would end in murder, and the law was starting to take a look at this fearsome miner with an insatiable bloodlust. Sensing the heat, Boone decided to head north to Oregon, the call of the Pacific Northwest awakening his wanderlust. The Johnson brothers would never see Boone again, but the news soon reached them of Boone's murderous past and his stay and escape from the sanitarium. It was a chilling moment when they realized how close to death they'd been while in the company of their cousin. They were tempted to write to family, telling them how Boone had been with them and murdered many a man in California as well, but they decided against it. They didn't want to break the bond of family. To rat out your own blood was without honor. They also fear retaliation if Boone ever caught wind of them telling tales. Boone meandered slightly north into Oregon. He had plenty of money from his time gold mining with his cousins and was well stocked with supplies. So he rode slowly as to enjoy himself after such a harrowing trip west from Missouri. He took up with caravans and travelers, drinking and bragging of his exploits. 
He gained a reputation on the road, even becoming a minor celebrity among the outlaws and desperados, and soon had his own gang of cutthroats and bandits he rode with. There were six of them, their names lost to the winds of time, besides one man named Burton. They took to robbery, becoming highwaymen, boldly sauntering into saloons at night, and all but daring the sheriff to fuck with them. It was a life Boone was born to live. But one sheriff did take an interest, making an investigation of the murders and robberies the six outlaws were accused of. Gathering enough evidence to draw up a warrant and forming a posse to gather the cutthroats up. But word of his coming reached the gang first. Boone wanted to straight up murder the sheriff, but the others convinced him it would be better to keep moving into Utah territory. In Utah, a massive silver deposit had been discovered, the Comstock Load, and there were sure to be many miners with pockets heavy with gold headed there to Utah that the gang could rob along the way. Also, the entire Utah Territory was governed by Mormons, and it was well known that Mormons, Mormons didn't much care what happened to settlers who weren't of their faith. So missing and murdered men that weren't Mormon weren't bound to be too investigated. Also, because the six had heard how the Mormons were polygamous, taking on many wives, they somehow came to the flawed conclusion that the women were loose and free in Utah. So they saw the Utah territories as a violent playground of sex and murder without consequences. So in October of 1859, the gang headed east toward the Utah Territories, just as winter was beginning to descend. Crossing the Grand Ronde River and passing beyond territory where the sheriffs of Oregon had jurisdiction. They headed to the Snake River, making good time, even though they were overloaded with supplies. But when they began to cross the Snake River, they were attacked by a group of Maidu Indians. Bullets began to rain down peppering the water about them. Medu were known as diggers back then because they built their dwellings into hillsides and also because they ate so many tubers. This was their land, their territory, and they had every right to defend it. Boone and his gang of outlaws knew there was no trying to reason or hold peace talks. They were trespassing. The only thing they could do was haul ass and hope to escape. So they whipped their horses onward, firing their pistols haphazardly over their shoulders as they rode in hopes of a lucky shot. And a lucky shot they got. This guy, he is nothing if not lucky, I tell you. It's crazy. The Maidu's leader's horse was struck and collapsed dead. And the other Maidu stopped their pursuit to help their fallen leader. And Boone and his gang made it away. Man, if I had like more time and research, I would. It, <laughs> serial killers have so much luck. It's it's got to be that whole theory I have that like if you just have the balls to do something and you do it, you you can I just you can probably get away with so much more than you think you can in this life because it's just that manifestation of belief that you're gonna get away with it, and they these guys do it. It's like crazy to me. Anyway, they rode hard until it was too dark to see, then made camp. Although they thought themselves safe, Boone insisted they post sentries. They camped by the river and a cliff wall, setting guards on either side to wake the rest if there was an attack. Boone awoke in the morning, never having been awakened for his turn at sentry duty. As he wandered out into the dawn, he saw why. One of the night watchmen lay with his throat slit. A Maidu had crept to their camp in the night, murdered him, and stole his horse. It was miraculous Boone and the others hadn't been killed as well. While cold, cruel, and cunning, the outlaws were no match for the Maidu who crept through their land like ghosts. Realizing if they took the main path, the Maidu were bound to find them and pick them off one by one, they took to the hills on a long, rambling route designed to throw the natives off their trail. The ploy worked. They lost their pursuers, but they were not in the clear. Mother Nature had other plans for them. 
a snow fell, making it impossible to scout landmarks. They began wandering aimlessly, often in circles. The snow did not let up, and soon they were in the midst of a blizzard, when luck again found them as they stumbled into Soda Springs. They weren't quite as lucky as they thought this time. The settlers of Soda Springs, sensing a deadly winter, had abandoned the settlement. But the six outlaws holed up in a cabin and waited out the storm. Boone was itchy and kept his pack ready for a quick departure, going out every day to check on the weather and conditions. This wasn't his first rodeo, and he was ready to abandon the others, if need be. The men soon ran out of provisions and began to eat the horse's oats. When that too ran out, Boone butchered horse for them to eat. Then another and another until all the horses had been consumed. They then skinned the animals and made snowshoes from their hide. When the horse meat began to dwindle, Boone announced he was heading out. There was no use staying there and facing sure starvation. The others reluctantly agreed and the men started out into the blizzard, Homemade snowshoes strapped to their feet, hoping to make it to Fort Hall. Boone soon outflanked them, his unwavering determination and savage endurance hastening his stride, seeing the others as dead weight. Only one man kept up with him, the one known as Burton. They left the others behind and marched onward, creating a bond of survival between the two men. They trudged forward together, eating handfuls of snow rather than breaking ice to find fresh water, chewing leathery horse jerky as they journeyed, traveling through the night, not daring stop for rest, knowing any pause would allow the deadly cold to seep into their bones. But Burton couldn't keep up. Just shy of Fort Hall, he collapsed in a copse of trees. But Boone made it striding into Fort Hall to find it abandoned. Just like Soda Springs, the settlers had left, thinking to fare the winter better in a large town. There was plenty of firewood, but they hadn't left a scrap of food behind. As Burton lay dying in the snow, a miracle happened. Boone had come back for his friend, lifting him up from the cold ground and carrying him into a cabin, sitting him beside a roaring fire. Gratitude overwhelmed him. His partner in crime had saved him from sure death. But his contentment and gratitude were short-lived, for soon Boone was kneeling above him with his bowie knife in his hand. And it was then that all the tales Boone had told of having to resort to cannibalism came flooding back into Burton's mind. Boone set to work hacking off Burton's leg. He was a crude butcher, digging into the meat of his thigh, sawing back and forth until he reached the femur bone. Burton put up a struggle, tried to fight back, punched and screamed and kicked, but he was no match for the savagery of Boone. When Boone had his large bowie knife positioned above the femur, he used his boot to pound on it until it eventually snapped the bone and Burton's leg came free of his body. Boone then used his belt as a tourniquet on the stump, squelching the bleeding, and soon the scent of roasting meat filled the room as Burton slipped into shock and passed out cold. When Burton eventually stirred back to consciousness, he was surprised to see Boone amiable and talkative, chatting amicably. He even offered Burton his plate, telling the man to eat some of the roasted meat. To eat his own leg, Burton was disgusted beyond belief. The idea made him sick, but he was so very, very hungry and eventually gave in, consuming his own flesh to survive. Boone knew. If he had just plain killed Burton, the meat would soon go rotten and foul. And if he attempted to preserve the meat in the snow outside, animals would find it and either consume it or ruin it. The best bet was just to keep Burton alive and healthy so he could feed off him slowly, as needed, piece 
by peace. As in Soda Springs, Boone was itchy to get traveling, and every day would wander out to judge the weather and conditions, see the prevailing winds, the clouds, hoping for a let-up. On one of these excursions, he left his revolver on the table. Burton saw it, and saw his chance as well. Enduring excruciating pain, he managed to ease himself up and slowly wiggle himself across the floor. It was an incredibly painful ordeal. Any minor bump to his stump sent his vision blurry, and he fought to keep his consciousness. Eventually, Burton managed to reach the revolver. He broke it open and looked to see only a single bullet in the cylinder. Unlike a rifle, revolvers at this time, with their stubby barrels, were notoriously inaccurate. It was even said a sure way to miss with a revolver was to actually aim at your target. Their popularity lay in the fact that there were so many rounds and one was eventually likely to meet its target. Burton sat there in despair. What would his fate be if he aimed and missed when Boone came walking through the door? What type of revenge would this bloodthirsty cannibal enact? Burton saw but one choice in his predicament. And stealing his nerves, he did what he had to do, lifted the gun to his temple, and squeezed the trigger. Boone returned from his outing, elated. The storm had ceased, the sky was clear, but his happiness with the weather changed to anger when he entered the cabin. Boone was livid to find Burton dead. The meat would surely rot now. So he preserved the meat he'd cut from Burton's leg the best he could, packaged it securely, then hacked off his other leg, wrapped it in one of his red flannel shirts, strapped it across his shoulders, and set off towards Salt Lake City. He regretted not being able to take all the meat he was leaving behind, the arms and torso. He could only carry so much weight. Boone struggled onward through the winter, but soon the leg meat of Burton was gone, and he was surviving on small game he trapped in snares, catching rabbits as he'd done as a child. But game was rare in the dead of winter, and as his strength began to dwindle and the cold set into his bones, he came across an encampment of Shoshone. The Shoshone were not known to be friendly to white settlers. Just a year earlier, they'd joined their allies, the Ute, in a war with Mormon settlers, the long and very bloody Walker War. Trade had just resumed, but it was an organized and formal affair with set regulations. A lone white man strolling uninvited into a Shoshone camp was absolute insanity, if not outright suicide. But Boone, he just walked right in and silently sat down before their fire. Many Native American tribes consider the insane to be touched by the spirit world. The Shoshone were a very spiritual people who believed in a spirit world which could be accessed through dreams and visions. Mental health was seen to be deeply intertwined with the spirit world. And to be violent towards one who was touched was strictly forbidden. Believing Boone to be touched, not only did they not kill him for trespassing on their land, they permitted him to stay and even fed him and gave him a blanket. But that's not to say they were happy about having this crazy white guy in their camp. And when a merchant and trader from Salt Lake City by the name of John W. Powell came to buy furs off the tribe, they eagerly handed Boone off to them. Powell charged them a few extra furs to take the touched Boone off their hands. Powell was kind to Boone, feeding him, even giving him whiskey, hoping it might get him talking. But Boone was tight-lipped and said nothing, though by his blood-streaked clothes and rotting horsehide shoes, Powell knew he must have had quite a story to tell. Eventually, the two reached Salt Lake City, where Boone wandered away without even a thank you. When the Mormons, or Latter-day Saints, Settled in Salt Lake City in 1847, after a long journey of being persecuted, ostracized, arrested, and even having their leader, Joseph Smith, murdered, no one really cared. Utah was considered a savage wasteland. So there they were free to practice their religion, which was polygamous at the time. 
it being believed the man needed at least three wives to enter the kingdom of heaven. But when silver was discovered in Utah, everything changed, and their claim to the state became contested. The last thing the federal government wanted was this strange religious sect to become an economic powerhouse. So it was agreed the Comstock load will be treated as gold had been in California and oil was in Texas. Stakes would be sold off and the wealth would be distributed across the country. Suddenly thousands were descending on Utah and these miners were a hard drinking, gambling lot, unlike the chaste and sober, hardworking Mormons. Tensions were high all around. When Boone arrived in Salt Lake City, he, like always, immediately got into a bar fight. But instead of being thrown into jail, he was secreted away to a Mormon basement where he was given a warm bed and plenty of food. The Mormon leadership had a plan. They had a ruthless and cold-blooded killer on their hands, and they planned to use him to their advantage. There were two miners in town who had established themselves as the meanest and toughest sons of bitches in Utah, and they were taking over the town with their ruthlessness. So the Mormon leadership decided to use Boone as an assassin to take them out. Boone had no problem with that. He thoroughly enjoyed killing and set right at it, murdering both men in cold blood right in the street. Boone most likely thought he'd be welcomed back with open arms and praise, but the Mormons had hoped he'd at least have some tact, not just shoot the men down in a crowded street with witnesses. So they paid him a few bucks for his trouble and ran him out of town under threat of arrest. Boone was back in the wilderness yet again, but the Mormons had put him in touch with a group called the Destroying Angels, a secretive militant vigilante group who were an offshoot of the Denites, who had been an early Mormon militia group that had been disbanded and condemned by the church for their violent ways. They were basically a secret society. Mormon leader Brigham Young, he denied their very existence. They worked with other fringe militias in an underground war against the native Ute nation. Boone, who was a racist and white supremacist and showed support for the Confederacy, took to killing the natives of Utah with a sick and depraved glee. Rape was not uncommon in these violent times, and Boone developed a reputation for taking it to horrific extremes and is said to have horribly mutilated the native women he'd captured. The other militia members, well, they were unnerved and wary of Boone because of this. They'd often send him off scouting far off places with another man who they also deemed too mentally unstable to be trusted. Life in the militia was beginning to grate on Boone. It was too much work. While he enjoyed the murder and rape, he also longed for whiskey, gambling, and lounging lazily about, and pined for his days as a bandit king. So he convinced the other unstable scout to desert and head up into Canada, to Caribou, where they'd heard gold dust was just lying in the stream beds in huge quantities, ripe for the picking. These two psychotic men ventured up into the Great White North, stopping to rest in a little town called Antler Creek. It just so happened that a large group of very successful French miners had also stopped in Antler Creek just pausing to get breakfast. The French miners had such a colossal load of gold, their animals struggled to carry it. Boone and his friend eyed their load, each knowing what the other was thinking, then followed in pursuit, tracked the French miners down as they moved across the Canadian wilderness and murdered them all. Boone and his companion now had $30,000 in raw gold, too much to carry. So they buried the massive hall, leaving the bloody bodies sprawled out in the road where they'd shortly be discovered. Brune's reputation had preceded him, and when news of the murders hit town, it wasn't too hard to put two and two together and tie the infamous outlaw who'd been there earlier to the robbery. A $700 bounty was put on Boone's head. 
Boone and his partner in crime ended up in Victoria, where the slow-moving news of the bloodthirsty outlaw and the bounty on his head had yet to reach. In the Adelphi Saloon, Boone simultaneously lost the money he had on him and ran up a huge bar tab. At closing, when the bartender asked Boone to settle up, Boone just replied, Don't you know that I'm a desperate character? The bartender sent a boy off to the police, and one Sergeant Blake quickly showed up, and Boone was arrested. Sergeant Blake had heard of some of the exploits of Boone and sent out word of his capture, thinking there surely must be some warrants or bounties on the notorious outlaw. But Victoria was a very isolated place, shut off from the rest of the world by frozen rivers and snowy mountains, and nothing came back, though the sergeant was sure there must be warrants out there somewhere. Ah, the good old days before the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Somehow, Boone was able to secure himself a good lawyer who claimed that the police of Victoria had willfully set about the destruction of Boone's good name and character, spreading rumors and innuendo about him. The judge found him guilty of the most lenient and undeniable of crimes, simply not having paid his bar tab. He served a short stint and was released. Oh, God. The sergeant was livid, cursing and spitting, one hand on his holstered pistol, contemplating just shooting the infamous outlaw as he walked out of jail a free man. Just three days later, as the ice melted and rivers thawed, mailed extradition requests began pouring in. But Boone was long gone. Lucky, lucky bastard. Crazy. It's How can evil people like this just be so lucky? I'm telling you, it's the like manifest <laughs> destiny. I guess. Yeah, it's like they just it's they're so confident and just desperate. It's I'm, it's just the psychopathy crazy. helps them because they they have no fear. Right. So and like, I don't know, it's just I feel like as like normal non sociopathic people, you 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 know, we all have had like a little taste of that when like you you throw all your fear out the window and you like do something crazy, you end up being able to do it. But then afterward, you're like, how the hell did I do that? What do they say in Dune? Fear is the mind killer. Yes. There you go. I doubt everything. I'm always like, oh, oh." (laughs) you get all anxiety. Yeah. I'd be a terrible serial killer. (laughs) That's okay. It's a good quality to have. I keep, I keep going back to thinking which one of the freeway killers was the one who carried the bodies out of the crowded hotel. That one kills me. Uh, uh, Randy, uh, Randy, a uh, craft. Yes. Yes. It's just I, like, how the fuck did he, I don't still don't know how he did that. It's nuts. Two bodies. Yeah. Just, Oh, my friends are really drunk. I'm just helping them get through the, yeah, he's, he's the like, hotel. He to burn, he's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Oh, all right. Back to Boone. Lucky bastard that he is. So, by chance, Boone was released the same day as a character known as Dirty Harris, and the two joined forces and became traveling companions. As Boone and his new road partner made their way to Antler Creek, where Boone had his buried treasure of $30,000 worth of gold, they passed through Sumas near Vancouver, when a miner who Boone had robbed at gunpoint and knew all about the bounty on his head spotted him. Boone spotted the miner as well. The two locking eyes. Normally, Boone would have shot him dead right there. But on this busy street, right in front of the constable Larry, he decided against it and instead immediately fled town. The miner alerted British authorities at Fort Yale, and a highly trained British cavalry unit was dispatched to track down the desperado and his partner with hunting dogs. But Boone proved elusive, and the trail went cold. That is, until Boone and Dirty Harris, <laughs> like, and I love these fucking names, <gasps> Boone and Dirty Harris were seen by trappers waiting along a river which kept their scent from the British tracking dogs. Eventually, the British cavalry unit found Boone a month later. Half-starved, exhausted, he gave himself up without a struggle. Like in Missouri all those years ago, he was more rescued than apprehended. But Dirty Harris was nowhere to be found. Fearing an ambush from the Cutthroat's road partner, the British troops demanded Boone tell them where Dirty Harris was, 
To which Boone replied, Why do you suppose that I'm fool enough to starve to death when I can help it? I ate him up, of course. The Kentucky cannibal strikes again. (laughs) Uh, Boone was extradited to the States and put in Port Townsend prison. It would be a short stay. He'd somehow managed to get his hands on a gardening trowel, and putting his skills as a miner to use, he dug himself a hole under the wall of his cell block and escaped. The judge hadn't even had time to decide his sentence. Boone made his way back to California, robbing and murdering all the way. But when he finally made it to San Francisco, he found his infamy had made it first. Wanted posters were plastered everywhere for the murdering prison escapee. Boone reverted to his old habit of sleeping in the stables of farmers in the surrounding hills of the Bay Area, where he was discovered by a rancher. But the rancher was a kindly man who had a soft spot in his heart for outlaws and took him in. The two would spend their nights drinking whiskey and playing cards, the lonely rancher happy to have some company. It was not a wise move. Soon, Boone grew bored with the arrangement and filled the kindly old rancher with hot lead as he slept, rummaging through his belongings and taking anything of value, leaving the bullet-ridden corpse in its bed, not a bit of remorse for murdering a man who'd shown him nothing but kindness. Boone stole the rancher's horse and decided to head north to Oregon, figuring no one would suspect such a bold move, and he'd hide right under their noses. He was filled with nostalgia for his glory days as a bandit king in the desolate hills of Oregon. But when he arrived, he was surprised to see how much it had changed. Progress had arrived, civilization streaming in, and the wild back roads where he'd prowled were now well-maintained and guarded. The villages where he once ran roughshod had put up walls and become respectable places. The wealth of the South had turned this last frontier into a well-fortified and law-abiding state. The endless wilderness now tamed. Boone holed up in Florence, a small oceanside town, where, though he dare not mention his real name, he still developed a reputation as a brawler and roughneck mountain man. Just as in Salt Lake City, this reputation led him to be hired as an assassin. This time, the target was one Dutch Fred, known as Chief. Chief ruled the town of Florence like a mafioso, demanding kickbacks and a taste of any illicit profits. Once hired, Boone made quick work of him, shooting him dead right there in the saloon where Dutch held court. Boone hightailed it out of there, heading back to Canada, but was waylaid by bounty hunters at the border and hauled back to Florence, where he was locked up in jail. It was assumed he'd easily be found guilty of murder. He'd shot Dutch Fred in cold blood in a crowded saloon. But that wasn't to be the case. Not a single witness would testify. Everyone denied having seen anything. Was it fear of the fearsome outlaw, you may ask? No, no, it was not. The cunning Boone had been writing letters to his older brother in Texas, keeping up a correspondence. This is the same brother he'd been planning to visit all those long years ago in Missouri. His brother, who now went by the name Old Tex, was an incredibly successful businessman and quite wealthy. Boone had begged his big brother to help him, and having sympathy for his kin, old Tex had bribed each and every witness. With no one to testify, Boone was acquitted and went free. Can you believe that shit, man? This guy is slippery as an eel. Not only was Boone a free man, all bounties on his head had been rescinded after his arrest. Fuck now, man. So, uh... (laughs) Looking for something new, he headed up into Montana territory, chasing the horizon, killing and looting as he went. Montana was rumored to be a lawless, violent place, and of course that suited Boone quite well. Territorial law hadn't reached the Montana territory yet, so the only law enforcement there were just small-town sheriffs 
who Boone didn't see as a threat. But Boone was in for a surprise. Crime there was very organized and run by an outfit known as the Innocents. The Innocents Gang were headquartered in a Rattlesnake Ranch outside Virginia City and operated a sophisticated criminal enterprise with members in mining settlements that passed on information about gold shipments. They communicated in secret code known only to them even tying special knots in their neckties to let other members know their affiliation. Boone's presence was soon known to them, and they swooped up on him, saying he had to have permission to work his crimes in their territory. They told him he'd have to be interviewed by their boss and to meet at the Bannock Saloon House in Virginia City that night. Boone went to the saloon, a little disconcerted to see the sheriff there, sitting only a few tables away. But soon Boone was slinging back the whiskeys and talking shit, having a rip-roaring good time while he awaited word from the secretive leader of the Innocence Gang. But the leader never showed up to interview him. And before he knew it, Boone was drinking with the sheriff, sharing crazy stories of his life on the road. After last call, as the patrons spilled out into the night, the sheriff turned to Boone and revealed that, in fact, it was he who was the leader of the Innocence Gang, and Boone was welcome to join. Boone took to life in the Innocence Gang like a complete natural, lounging about the Rattlesnake Ranch drinking whiskey until he was called on to go ambush some miner laden down with gold. Boone relished the work in good times, developing a fierce reputation and becoming known as the gang's enforcer. But in 1863, the miners in Montana formed their own gang, the Vigilance Committee of Alder Gulch. Basically, there was no real law in the Montana Territory, so the Vigilance Committee had as much rights and jurisdiction as the sheriff. They began to investigate, extract names, and one by one, members of the Innocence Gang began disappearing. Eventually, it was revealed to them that the leader was, in fact, the sheriff. The sheriff was ambushed and thrown into his own jail cell. Then the rest of the Innocents were rounded up as well. Boone was at the saloon, belly up at the bar when they came to take him. Two men squeezed up on either side of them then quickly locked arms with him while a third came up behind and shoved the barrel of a gun into his back. Smart men. They weren't taking any chances with this bloodthirsty killer. A gallows was erected in the town center, and 3,000 people showed up to see the execution of the Innocence Gang members. The first to be hanged was Three-Fingered Jack. A noose was put around his neck, and he was stood on a box. The rope was purposefully short, so that when the box was kicked out from under him, his neck didn't snap and kill him instantly. Instead, he swung, kicking and squirming, his face growing purple as he slowly strangled to death. Boone shouted out, Kick away, old fella. It's my turn next. I'll be in hell with you in a minute. (laughs) This guy's too much. (laughs) But when the executioners turned their attention to Boone, he had another thing coming for them. He screamed, Every man for his principles. Hurrah for Jeff Davis. Let her rip. And leapt off the box with enough force that his neck was snapped. His corpse slammed into the executioner, knocking him over, then knocked fellow gang member Zachary off his perch beside him, sending him to his death as well. In death as in life, Levi Boonhelm brought a wave of destruction and mayhem down about him. <laughs> Too much. Boonhelm was buried at Boot Hill Cemetery, where his grave can still be viewed to this day. And I got it's a really spooky looking gravestone. I'll put a picture of it up on the Instagram. Nice. And yeah, it's really cool. And for those who don't know, uh, when he said hurrah for Jeff Davis, he was talking about Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy. So he also died as a white supremacist asshole as well. Damn. 
And there you have it, fellow freaks and dear listeners. The lifetimes and death of the infamous Wild West outlaw and despicable serial killer, Levi Boone Helm, the Kentucky Cannibal. Thanks so much for listening, and be sure to tune in next week for more wild tales here on Murder Coaster. And hey, we want to hear from you. Have a case you think we should cover? Did we get something wrong? Or do you just want to say hi? Email us at murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. That's murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. Don't be a stranger, partner. Yeehaw! <laughs>